next leadership dialogue will discuss the future trade and investment. And to moderate this discussion, I'd like to give a brief about our moderator of the day, Martha Moore, Chief Economist of the American Chemistry Council. Based in Washington, D.C., the American, the American Chemistry Council is, Council is a leading voice of the chemical industry in the United States. The ACC represents more than 150 companies from large multinational firms to small and medium-sized enterprise. Martha Moore, welcome on stage. Good morning, and uh, thank you very much to GPCA and Qatar Energy for the opportunity to participate in this forum. Um, I'm very excited about this morning's uh, panel. We're going to talk about uh, the future of trade and investment. The Gulf region is becoming increasingly prominent on the global stage. Recent and upcoming conferences are creating the frameworks that will shape trade policy and the investment landscape for decades to come. And much of this activity is happening in the Gulf region. As we gather here in Doha, COP28 is taking place in Dubai. Last Friday, the Climate Club was also launched in Dubai. The Climate Club, led by Germany, is a group of 36 climate ambitious countries uh, with the goal of effectively implementing the Paris Agreements with a particular focus on industrial decarbonization. Next February, the 13th WTO Ministerial will meet in Abu Dhabi. And while not in the Gulf region, the UN International Negotiating Committee on Plastic Pollution met last month in Nairobi to continue work on a legally binding international treaty on plastic production. I'm sorry, plastic pollution. All of these activities will in, impact how industry does business, and it puts a spotlight on trade and investment. It's not a coincidence that the Gulf region has become the new center of gravity for these globally important activities. The perspective of the Gulf region is critical um, as these agendas uh, of these organizations move forward. The world needs to hear different voices on these issues. Concerningly, the UN and other organizations are discussing bans, production caps, and other restrictions on the use of chemicals and plastics that could have a significant impact on the way that this business, uh, that this industry does business. Industry needs to be engaged to drive these organizational agendas in a positive direction, promoting solutions across the value chain and enhancing rather than hindering economic growth. The business community needs to demonstrate that it is part of the solution, not the problem. And there needs to be a larger coordinated effort to encourage these governing organizations to adopt policies that promote economic growth while simultaneously making progress on the myriad objectives set out in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The UN Sustainable De Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, were developed in 2015 to characterize what a more sustainable and equitable world would look like by 2030. We're now at the halfway point, and much work remains to be done. If the SDGs are to be achieved by 2030, more than $30 trillion of new investment is necessary over the next eight years according to the World Investment Report issued by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. The chemical industry, of course, plays an essential role in driving progress across all uh, three dimensions of sustainable development, environmental, social, and economic. And it's helping address and overcome the world's most pressing sustainability challenges, in particular, the transition of the world economy to a lower emissions future. Clearly, chemistry is the science behind sustainability. A recent analysis from Deloitte found that 75% of the emissions reductions required to reach a, a global net zero goal by 2050 uh, will use technologies that rely on inputs from the chemical industry. The chemical industry can help forge a path forward toward, toward a lower emissions future by innovating and creating emissions reduction pathways across the chemical value chain. Many companies here in this room are leaders in this space. Industry is investing and deploying new products and technologies around the globe. 
The industry is foundational to several sustainable development goals by making materials for the clean provision of drinking water, uh, delivering a safe and adequate food supply, and ensuring that deadly diseases are eradicated by developing groundbreaking medicines and medical treatments. We're also helping the global economy improve energy efficiency in today's uh, modern transportation vehicles and buildings. And while investment is key, trade also plays an important role in delivering materials and technologies for a more sustainable future around the world. Tariffs and other non-tariff barriers to trade prevent the efficient distribution of goods and services to countries that need access to them. And customs and trade facilitation measures will demonstrate concrete environmental and sustainable benefits and create new investment and economic value chains. And while, of course, our industry is essential to a more sustainable uh, future for this world, we must acknowledge our own contribution to carbon emissions. According to the International Aid Energy Agency, the chemical industry accounted for 2.5% of global emissions in 2022. After peaking at 1.32 tons of CO2 uh, per ton of chemical output in 2015, chemical industry carbon intensity has flattened out at around 1.3, well above the 0.95 uh, tons in IEA's net zero emissions scenario in 2030. The levers to lower emissions for the chemical industry are diverse, including greater use of renewable power, such as wind and solar, the potential of hydrogen as a lower emission fuel, carbon capture utilization and storage, and advanced recycling, just to name a few. But deploying these technologies at scale is a massive undertaking that will require billions of dollars of investment. This panel will explore the opportunities and uh, barriers to investment needed to realize a lower emissions future and the role of trade policy in bringing sustainable solutions and products to new markets. I'm pleased to be joined by a panel of chemical industry leaders with deep expertise in this space. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them and then um, welcome them onto the stage. Uh, Mr. Mutlak al Morshed is CEO and board member of the Saudi company Tazni. Tazni was established in 1985 as the first Saudi uh, industrial joint stock company wholly owned by the private sector. Now, Tazni is one of the largest Saudi and GCC industrial and petrochemical companies and one of the largest global investors in titanium value chain. I would like to welcome Gina Fry, CEO and founder of Integra Petrochemicals. Founded in 1989, the company is often described as the blueprint of a successful global petrochemical trading company with offices worldwide. The company is headquartered in Singapore, where Gina is based, and trades a wide range of bulk petrochemical gases, aromatics, and petrochemical liquids. And finally, Greg Skelton leads government relations for SABIC in the Americas. A former New Zealand diplomat, Greg represented New Zealand in WTO non-agricultural market access negotiations at the start of the Doha round. At SABIC, Greg is actively involved in international trade and sustainability advocacy, including co-chairing industry coalition engaging in UN negotiations on the uh, public on the global plastics agreement. Welcome them to the stage. All right. I think we're in for a very uh, robust discussion. But let's start off with what are some of the innovations and technologies developed by the chemical industry that can be considered critical to combating climate change and improving environmental sustainability? Uh, Greg, can you talk a little bit about what Sobic's doing? Sure. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of the products in our portfolio are contributing to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Um, from fertilizer, which is increasingly targeted and focused on um, making the best use of resources to grow the food that we need, um, to the transportation sector, uh, building and construction, electronics and healthcare. Um, a lot of the products that we make are essential to achieving a sustainable future. 
um, and uh, a lot of the work that we do around the world um, is to make sure that those, those solutions can be deployed uh, in the most effective way. Okay. And Tazdi is also doing a lot in this space. Can you tell yes. us? Yes. Uh, thank you, Martha. Just a small correction to your statement earlier on the podium. We don't call it in this part of the word plastic pollution. We'd rather call it plastic production. So that's, that's what we do. And I, I feel uh, at home in the panel of Gina, who is a member of ITC, where I chair it in the GBCA, International Trade Committee, and Greg, the companies where I used to work a few years ago. So it's, it's like home here. In Tasnia, uh, we're quite the largest recycler in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and we actually take out of the recycle pool uh, two million car batteries acid lead, and we bring them back as new batteries in the GCC and the Saudi market and Europe and Africa. So uh, we do a huge part, and we're big recyclers, mechanical, thermal, and we're getting into catalytic and, and so on. And I think the solution for a lot of the issues in the world, especially the green gases and so on, lies in the chemical industry. We are really a solution provider. We have the scientists, we have the know-how, and this is what we do day in and day out. And nobody knows our industry plus other industry because chemicals are in everything, including our own bodies. If you look at the human body, it's mostly composed of chemicals. So uh, this is important, and we bring it uh, to the whole universe, really. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And shipping, of course. Um, there are a lot of changes that are happening in that sector as well, Gina. Yeah, and shipping is critical to, obviously, the movement of feedstocks, uh, raw materials, and finished products. Uh, so shipping is not going to go away. Uh, shipping is going through a transition now as well, uh, because it's responsible for, depending on what publication you read, uh, between 3 and 7% of uh, global CO2 emissions. Uh, that is going through a transition. Uh, changes have already started. We're all into low sulfur fuel or scrubbers, more and more low sulfur fuel. And now, of course, as we go into buying new ships in that cycle, uh, we're having to look at alternative means of, alternative means of fuel in line with what the IMO is giving us uh, as a five-year guideline. Great. So yeah, it sounds like there's a lot, a lot of innovation and, and movement already happening mm -hmm. in this space. Um, given the tremendous amount of investment that will be needed in the coming decades uh, to lower carbon emissions in the chemical industry, what are some of the challenges companies face when attracting investment and financing for these projects? Uh, Mr. al Moshad, let's begin with you. Thank you. Uh, well, been involved in the financial industry world for the last 30 years plus. So the reality of any financial institution is it will go to the best projects with the highest IRR. And of course, environmental is part of the things today, but if you come to a bank with all environmental and no return, no bank will finance you. That's the reality of the matter. We can do good and do everything, but we have to face reality. Shareholders won't return. They want dividend, they want capital gains, and any institution will never sit on the money. You know the banks have to go rebu and reverse rebu, and they cannot keep the money in the treasury and put it back in the central bank and actually pay for it, and then take it back the next day uh, and pay in higher for it. So banks will always give money. Uh, the difficulty you face these days uh, in some of the projects around the world is the Standards. What, what standard you set for these things? Because a lot of things are changing as we speak. Technology, everywhere. Let it be capture, let it be, you know, a green initiative, let it be anything. But it's, a lot of it is immature at the moment. There is a lot of technology being developed and so on. So this is what kind of make it difficult, actually not only for the borrower, but also for the lender. Because you want to follow the basic signs and to finance, where everybody is happy and everybody makes money at the end of the day, but at the same time, you do good for the environment. And therefore, uh, these things will be a challenge. I think a lot of countries today, frankly, they have the financial resources. This part of the world can finance mostly its project without even going outside. China for sure does. Uh, India, to a certain extent, does. 
And this is where the growth, to be honest, the growth is not in Europe, in the US with the shale gas and so on, but uh, growth is in Asia, that, that's where it is. And Asia and this part will finance mostly its projects. So that's, that's will be my views on it. Great. What's been Sabek's experience, Greg? So I think ultimately the business case has to make sense, right? Um, and uh, one of the ways, one of the important ways, particularly in, in investing in, in these new technologies, is that the governments have to get the policy settings right. Um, and we've seen governments, some have, some have done a, a better job than others uh, in, in doing that. Um, you, you know, to, to, you, you're ultimately looking to de-risk uh, your investment as much as possible. And I think um, there, there are various ways you can do that, right? Um, but ultimately, uh, the, the operating environment in which you, in which you operate has to, has to be conducive uh, to facilitate those investments. Um, we heard this morning uh, Peter Van Acker and, and Bruce Chin talking about solving the plastic pollution challenge. And Sabic is a founding member of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, and I think one of the one of the things that the Alliance is really focused on is the initial de-risking of the investment um, because you do need to make sure that for the outside sources of, of investment, private equity, um, other funds that are out there, that um, they're able to make their return. Um, and, and I think um, we have to be creative uh, in the ways in which we address the challenges in front of us. Mm -hmm. Gina, um you know, uh, the shipping industry, they're making a lot of investments in, in new technologies and, and new capital. Um, what are some of the financing challenges that your se sector faces? Well, it's really quite difficult because, of course, we've seen, at best, shipping is seen as a, a gray industry. Mm. Um, usually, it's considered a dirty industry. Um, Non-essential, which is a bit of a joke. Um, and so financing, particularly over the last couple of years, has become more and more difficult um, because a lot of banks, certainly Western banks, um, are of the mind that they only want to invest in truly green projects. Now, how do you make a ship truly green? Um, that's hard. Uh, and that's a stepwise process. So uh, it's, it's a, maybe a mean thing to say, but to a certain extent, you need to understand the boxes that the bank is ticking um, and to make sure that you're actually not just doing the right thing and not just doing the best thing, um, but you're actually ticking the boxes. And what we've, uh, or the boxes that the bank has to, has to feed back on uh, what we've found is the easiest thing to do is to, and we're looking as a family at um, uh, four plus two plus two tankers uh, just now. And those have to be dual fuel. They're going to be really expensive. Uh, you know, they need all the, the measurements and everything, all the, the recording systems uh, that new ships have. Um, and we kind of have the opinion that we will use our war chest that we built ourselves and do it ourselves rather than go and have to deal with banks or private equity um, because they are all being judged on their ESG because most of them are stock listed and a lot of them don't quite understand shipping either. Um, and what we found is when we've said that we're going to do that, then suddenly what happens is banks are more interested um, because they see that what we're trying to do is actually part of a transition and part of an improvement uh, in the situation. So, uh, but you've got to be brave and you need the money already um, to be able to get their attention, to be honest. Um, because it is, it is very difficult for, for banks. Uh, it is very difficult for, for funds as well. Um, but they have to be rated on their ESG. So you see that some of the big private equity funds are now saying we will not invest in oil and gas, we will not invest in chemicals, we will not invest in shipping. Uh, to be fair, we're very happy that some of the private equity companies have moved away from shipping um, because it's less likely to be boom and bust. 
and ships will be built because they're needed rather than because of, uh, well, that's a good transportation hedge. Mm -hmm. So, but it, but it is difficult and it's very confusing deciding what, what dual fuel you want. Um, I mean, do you want hydrogen? Probably not. Uh, do you want methanol? Well, that's an interesting one. Do you want uh, ammonia? Another interesting one. Do you want small nuclear reactors? That's actually quite a good one, but probably isn't one that's <laughs> going to work. But then you've got to look at cradle to grave because ships use a lot of steel. Uh, that steel has to be made in a, in a green way, shall we say, using green electricity. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you need to do it sustainably. But you have to look at the fuel also from cradle to grave because there isn't enough methanol at the moment in the world um, to be able to fuel those ships if we all decide to go to methanol. Mm -hmm. And the easiest thing to do if you want more methanol is coal to methanol. And somehow that seems to be not the right thing to do. Uh, ammonia, are you taking it away from fertilizers? You know, one of, one of the UN principles is food. Uh, so we shouldn't be taking ammonia and fueling ships. We should be using that perhaps for fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole pile of issues and it's anything but straightforward. No, it doesn't sound like it. It's a tough needle to thread. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Especially true. if you're short-sighted. <laughs> right. True. Mr. Elmer said, um, can you talk a little bit about whether there are geographic uh, disparities in investment barriers and what can be done to promote more equitable access to decarbonization investments? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the world is not equal, uh, frankly. Uh, there is different standards, uh, unfortunately, being applied by banks or others, uh, you know, if you make standards based on European or US who spent the last 100 years plus polluting till they got to where they got today and suddenly they want to use that standard and want to apply it in a country that is developing, that is basically almost telling people in India or China or something, frankly, we want you to stay poor. That's the bottom line because they're going to have to produce as much as they can at the lowest emission as they can, but they cannot match a European that spent 100 years polluting and then suddenly becoming clean, taking years to become clean, and bring it to a country that is developing. So the standard has to be fair across the board, if possible. But what we are seeing, uh, Martha, is there is a lot of local institution, financial, government funds, who are willing to be logical and reasonable in looking at, you know, if you're doing good for the environment, you're doing the best you can, you're also creating jobs, you're also improving the living standard for the, the, the average person in the street, I think the finance will be there. And some institution, what um, really Gina said, if the the banks see Gina and her others doing financing their things and not coming to them. That's a big threat. You know, bank at the end of the day has to make money. Otherwise, shareholders will move somewhere else. Let's be frank and honest. It's always good and to be nice and everything. But at the end of the day, investors want to return. I mean, we, we all know that in a, in a different scene, different everything in the world. So I think... You know, the standard has to improve over time. It's not going to happen over time. Let's be realistic. We're not going to reach a standard, you know, like methanol firing versus nuclear reactor versus something. Uh, but even what uh, Gina just said about steel, you know, steel, you have to reduce the iron oxide. <laughs> what do you do it with? You have to use carbon to reduce it. So scientifically, you are there and you have to recapture the carbon and all that, but you cannot do without. So it's the law of physics. We cannot change it simply as that. So I think ultimately, uh, common sense will prevail. When we are in a transition, and transition is always difficult for any, for any uh, situation. But ultimately, common sense will prevail, and I think we'll come to a reasonable things between investors, lenders, borrowers, it will take some time, so we should not say, well, you, America, or Europe, Japan, whatever, you reach this level, we're going to bring China, India, or the rest of the world of Africa 
uh, exactly at the same speed. That's impossible. We need transition. Countries need transition to reach these kind of levels. Otherwise, like I said earlier, Martha, you're telling them to stay poor, and, and nobody will accept that. China will not accept, India will not accept, and now you're talking about almost one half to two thirds of the world population. And you know, the environment is global. Climate is global. You cannot say, well, I'm gonna be clean in Europe and the US, so, khalas, that's it. Well, you can't do that, it's impossible. So I think it will come, but it will take time, and it takes some reasonableness in the part of everybody. Nadia earlier, was my colleague in the board of uh, GBCA, said earlier, the greenwash. This is a problem. People throwing things and washing with green, making things like electric cars look like perfect. In reality, you know, it's different. If you have electric car, but the power coming from Germany today firing coal, is that really green? You know, you have to be realistic. You have to ask yourself. So this, this is what I think. Uh, but I am optimistic. I think common sense will prevail and, and a logic will, will, will get somewhere. That's Thank you. So. <laughs> um, Greg, given your experience as a diplomat, uh, can, how can governments create stable and supportive policy frameworks that promote long-term incentives for decarbonization investments? And what are some of the key pillars of, of such a framework? Thanks, Martha. You know, I think in the past um, we saw 70 years of of globalization and free trade set the basis for, for the world's sustainable development. Um, and that's really the reason why the GATT was established, right? I mean, uh, we had, went through two very destructive world wars. The GATT was established, which led to the development of the WTO. And we saw 50 years of, of, of largely peace and development uh, around the world. Unfortunately, we're not always the best at learning from history. Um, and in recent years, we've seen an element of deglobalization uh, come to the fore again. Um, and in fact, governments today are increasingly uh, adopting more of an industrial policy uh, to set the, 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 the stage for globalization. And there's been various different approaches to that. Um, heard um, on the last panel talk about the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which has attempted to give a more carrots than sticks approach to uh, setting the conditions for, for decarbonization. We've seen other approaches taken in Europe, um, which are a little bit more punitive uh, in the way in which um, that, has been, that has been established. So I think time will tell which of those uh, approaches is, is the more successful. Ultimately, uh, governments have uh, are seeking to, to meet several objectives um, when, they are, when they're setting policy. Um, decarbonization is obviously one of them, but equally they're trying to grow their economies. Um, they, are, they are trying to attract manufacturing and the right types of manufacturing um, as, they, as they move forward. Um, and and the, to the point that Mr. Marish had just made, I, I think, look, um, uh, the, there, are, there are countries, particularly in Asia, uh, and, and in the Middle East where there are large uh, populations of youth that will want to emerge into the middle class and um, they have to be given that, that room to grow. Um, and so I think, um, I think you'll see a range of, of different approaches around the world. I don't think you will see uh, uh, any one consistent policy formula. It'll be more unique to the particular circumstances that are out there. Great, <clears throat> great. Um, Gina, IMO, um, International Maritime Organization member states, adopted the Strategy on Reduction of Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Ships in 2023, setting targets for emissions, and the EU is getting ready to bring shipping into the ETS. How could these new rules impact the shipping industry? Well, it starts on the 1st of January, mm -hmm. uh, so ships are being fixed now from different parts of the world into uh, the EU, and there still is no consensus as to how this is going to work. Uh, it's going to be a mess. Uh, <laughs> the first quarter, <laughs> particularly, is going to be a mess for, for anybody who doesn't understand it or hasn't really had to deal with it yet. Um, effective the 1st of January, any ship uh, coming in from outside of the EU, uh, the owner uh, will have to pay uh, a a tax, a tariff, whatever you want to nicely call it, um, for the fact that they're traveling around, transporting product, burning fuel. 
Um, and that, part, that cost is going to be dependent on the distance traveled, uh, the amount, the weight of cargo on board. It's a whole big formula, which is quite complicated, actually. Um, and so you don't really know until you get there and deliver to your customer exactly how much that tariff is going to be. So I was actually looking at some of the emails from our own office today on how this is going because, you know, it's one minute to midnight or probably 20 seconds to midnight. And there seems to still be no consensus. What some owners are willing to do is to put it into the freight. So freight costs will go up. Uh, what some people are saying is, no, 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 if we're going to... Uh, not put it into the freight because that will make us look less competitive. Uh, we're going to charge that the same as we would war risk insurance and that comes as a separate invoice at the end of the voyage, once it's calculated. Um, and there is no consensus. And on clauses in charter parties, those clauses in charter parties are all over the place. Um, everybody's going to have to put into their contracts of cargoes going in or out of Europe. Um, new clauses uh, based on this. Uh, BIMCO, which is an owner's organization that tends to set uh, frameworks for clauses in contracts. Um, they've been trying to write this, I think, for the last two years. And I understand this morning it might not be ready till April. And when it is ready, this is an owner's textbook. Um, so I looked at several this morning. Uh, they're all different. Uh, we've been talking to some of the some of the petrochemical majors who ship product. Uh, Shell might do something, Exxon might do something else. Uh, nobody's quite sure. Some of the traders don't know. Some of the traders do. So anybody delivering in January, good luck. Sounds like that's going to really complicate <clears throat> supply chains. Uh, um, well, it's not going to help um, <laughs> because, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, yeah, but if I'm um, 300 miles off the coast and I transship material, I won't have to pay the tax or the tariff. Um, it doesn't work like that. The EU have it covered. Uh, there will be tariffs and they will be, they will be paid and the governments are going to make sure they've paid. Um, is it a form of taxation? In a way, it's supposed to be designed to help balance things, balance the efforts that the European companies have made in carbon, mm. um, so that countries and companies from outside of the EU <clears throat> who haven't stepped up to that challenge perhaps as much are going to have to pay. Um, what's going to happen is I don't think actually it's really going to help um, because if somebody in Europe, a buyer, wants to buy something and the European market's bad enough, uh, if we offer them some, a choice, here you are, you can have this from Italy and it costs $1,000 or here you can have this from China and with the tax it costs 980 I'm kind of confident what's going to happen and that's not how it's supposed to be. Interesting. So it's a confusing one. Yeah, sure. it sounds like there's going to be some ripple effects to that. Um, Greg, turning to trade as a lever for promoting sustainability, um, what can the chemical industry contribute specifically to support WTO efforts and the broader agenda on the trade and sustainability environment, uh, uh, environmental sustainability? So the last major global trade round that was successfully concluded was in the 1990s. Uh, I think it's no secret that the WTO has struggled uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, to outline the agenda, there's been some sectoral agreements that have been successfully concluded, but we really, the WTO hasn't really been able to move forward in a major sense uh, on responding to the, the, to the changing environment. Um, and uh, there is a process going on right now, um, some discussions on how can the WTO best contribute to trade and sustainability. And the International Council of Chemical Associations has actually made a contribution to that debate, um, submitted a couple of, uh, of working papers and engaging in the WTO public forum. 
Um, and, and the suggestions that the industry is making are, are really um, how, to, to frame it in terms of the WTO supporting the transition to a, a circular and sustainable economy uh, and, and taking practical measures uh, to try and do that. So looking at standards and definitions um, and how those can be um, better harmonized and applied uh, globally. Um, looking at best practices. Um, uh, for example, we have the Basel Convention out there which uh, regulates trade and hazardous waste. And how can we have best practices that um, facilitate trade um, and, and promote circularity rather than hinder it? Um, looking at customs classifications. Um, how do we make the customs world uh, be more responsive to, uh, to trade and sustainable materials? Um, and so that we're, again, facilitating trade rather than putting uh, unnecessary uh, barriers in the way to it. And then regulatory cooperation, I think, is also an important point. Um, obviously, governments are going to regulate to meet their, their national needs. Uh, but if you have 190 governments all regulating in different ways, it doesn't exactly facilitate business, right? So how can we encourage governments to work together to make sure that their regulatory regimes interact um, in a way that facilitates um, the, the business community rather than, uh, rather than interrupts it? Um, so those are some of the suggestions that the global industry has made. Those discussions are, are ongoing in the WTO right now. Uh, but I think it's, it's really important that we work with governments to, uh, to really give the WTO a clear vision uh, for the future. Great. Um, so we talked earlier about uh, the innovations and technologies that the chemical industry has brought forward to reduce emissions. So, you know, the, the hidden champions uh, mm -hmm. theme. Um, what are some of the trade elements that c can enable scale of these innovations? Um, Gina, as a shipper, do you want to uh, start us off? Well, I, th I think b the big companies like Maersk, like Stoll, like Oldfiel, many of the, the others have already started. They've all done, all done a lot. There's an awful lot of research going on. Uh, you can measure everything. Uh, therefore, you can change your route depending on the weather, which is a strange thing, but very effective. Uh, you can slow steam. So if you sail slower, you consume less fuel. Um, therefore, uh, you reduce emissions. Uh, that's maybe not going to work very well in just-in-time delivery, um, but maybe we need to get used to those type of things because um, the results of a lot of the tests have, sh have shown that if you uh, travel carefully with the weather um, and you s reduce your, your, your sailing rate, uh, you can save up to 30% of the emissions. Uh, if you change the, the shape, style of your rudder, double, have a double rudder, um, you can reduce your, your utilization of fuel. If you use the right type of paint, but that's a petrochemical, um, if you use the right type of paint, uh, you reduce slip. Friction. Um, and so uh, you <clears throat> get through the water uh, better and use less fuel. Uh, so there's a, it's a whole pile of little, little, little things. Um, and, and it's learning. I mean, some of the, looking back on it now, the chaos that was caused by uh, strippers on ships uh, when we were being told to uh, either go to low carbon fuel, except nobody really knew where it was going to be and if it was going to be available. Um, there's still no standardized specifications for low sulfur fuel. Uh, each company has different specs. Uh, I'm sure we're getting there. But so some of the, the bigger ships um, went the, split, uh, the uh, stripper route. And the first stripper designs were taking the sulfur out and putting it in the sea, which that was okay, apparently. Um, but then, then it wasn't okay because it obviously hadn't been properly thought through. Um, so that had to stop. And so it's step by step, step by step. There's a lot of learning. Um, and learning from each other. Uh, so it's a lot of collaboration and communication 
and people be wi being willing to share. Um, and I think we'll be able to innovate and develop a lot faster if we're all willing to share. And th I think the same goes with the, the, the chemical companies and the recycling companies. Mm -hmm. And we talk about bringing it to scale, but in many respects, it's not one size fits all when it comes to uh, uh, waste, because where is all the waste currently coming from? It's coming from certain countries, certain seas, certain rivers, um, and we can't take a big company solution necessarily into parts of Asia or into parts of Africa. It needs to be fit for purpose and it needs to be usable solutions for them. And so we think that's part of the solution. It's not everything being to scale, it's being scaled to the right purpose and yeah. the right place. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Mr. Amorshad? Yes. Um, the uh, elements of trade that uh, can enable these, these innovations. Uh, yes, definitely, uh, you know, uh, in this field, like Gina said, with the shipping and things, they definitely need innovation. Having the, the paint is in the chemical industry gives you slippage factor, meaning less friction. That reduces the consumption of fuel. And innovation will always be there in the chemical industry, and it's been there for hundreds of years. That's where we came, where we are, from using wood and steel to using plastic and cars and planes. And this is actually positive because it really reduces the weight of a car or a plane or something, and this way you reduce the fuel, i.e. you reduce the pollution. So if you looked at the chemical industry and the contribution of the world, we see it earlier, it's very small. We're having a big noise in the chemical industry, but the reality of the matter, we are minimal. If you compare it to building or transport or anything. So, but it is the industry that brings the innovation to. It's highly scientific. It has a lot of research, and it does a lot of good things. And therefore, I think that will continue, and it should be encouraged globally. And a lot of the innovation, you can see it nowadays, coming from Asia, and because Asia, by, by just nature, is the biggest continent, and it has the people in it, and the numbers, and all that. And you see the recycling, and the improvement, and what's happening around the globe. So I think we're going to get there, and, and innovation will be, a I mean, will be the, you know, the cornerstone of all of this, and it has to be financed, of course. There is no free lunch in the real world. We all know that. <laughs> we wish there is. <laughs> Maybe at GBCA you can have a free lunch, <laughs> but don't worry, you're paying for it. <laughs> so uh, that's shipping the same. I mean, I, I, I can hear what Gina's saying, but most of me as a receiver, either hiring her ship to deliver or receiving something, we want it in time. Mm -hmm. And the customers we have seen, you know, you hear these things about green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. A lot of these projects, by the way, if you don't know or you know, they've been canceled. You know why they canceled? Because nobody signed an enough take agreement. So who's going to invest so much money in a green or blue hydrogen when the customer is not willing to pay the delta? for that capex and opex. So this is where the reality has, we have to face. At the end of the day, I am sure Gina and every other shipper, Joe Tanker and whoever stole, is gonna pass it to the consumer. Ultimately, that's where it's gonna end. We like it or not. So we have to be realistic and we have to, have to do it and do it fair, improve the environment, but don't go crazy over a short period of time. We, we have to have time to basically transition. That happens in everything. You know, we came from a stone age and iron age and, and all that age, bronze age. We did not do it overnight. It took us years and years. And I am a believer this will do. Shipping, as she said, will be a mess probably for a while. <laughs> but ultimately, European or whoever, they want things delivered. And they want some of their country also taken out and delivered to some other trading destination. And if you isolate yourself, then what happened? You, you're going to say, be good, but I'm going to live in a cave. If you want zero emission, really, you might as well live in a cave. But no one today, everybody today wants light, everybody wants electricity. Can you imagine living in this part of the world without air conditioning? 
or living in Europe in January, February without heating. You know, they ha we have to be realistic. We have to do these things and we have to innovate and bring green, let it be nuclear, let it be solar, let it be wind. But all these things have chemical in them. <laughs> the solar panel, you know, the polysilicon and the frame, what is it? It's, it's also comes from us in the chemical industry. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you talked about sort of the, the technological evolution of the, the, you know, Stone Age to the Bronze Age and so on and so on. And, and that has a trade element, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the solar panel, that everything, it's great, but it took a lot of years to reach where we reach. Mm -hmm. I remember being in the industry looking at it 10, 15 years ago, we were using mirrors and concentrating and boiling water and all that thing. Then came the photovoltaic and and all these things, and it came, came actually improvement in the chemical industry, producing better polysilicon and better, uh, you know, better plastic holding the frame together and all these things. That's, and that's what's going to happen. Yeah. And it's going to happen over time, Martha. It's like, it's not going to be between the Stone Age and Bronze Age. <laughs> oh, no, it's no. not going to be hundreds <laughs> of thousands of years, because today technology moves fast. Right. Communication moves fast. Any incident happening in the world today, you hear it in seconds, even. not in minutes even. Yeah. So that's, that's what's going to happen, I think. Yeah, even faster and faster. Um, Greg, what are your thoughts on how uh, you know, the world, not the World Trade Organization, but global trade can facilitate you know, transition, or bringing these new innovations to all countries and all places that need to have access to them? So I, uh, last month I was in Nairobi at the third round of negotiations on a global plastics agreement. And I think one of the things that governments aren't yet appreciating is how important trade is to a circular economy. Um, you know, under the Basel Convention, there were some restrictions placed on, on, on trade and plastic waste. And they were put in place for a good reason, which was that in the past we'd seen waste exported from the developed world to the developing world, right? And no one wants that. Uh, no one wants waste to be dumped anywhere, particularly because in the case of plastic, that waste is a valuable resource. Um, and in the context of the, of the plastics agreement to facilitate a circular economy, and we just heard this morning that um, you know, all of the companies that are investing in making circular plastics cannot get enough raw materials to meet customer demand, right? And, and through to 2030, there's not gonna be enough capacity out there to meet customer demand. Um, and so the only way that we can, uh, we can you know, increase that is to improve the collection of waste. Um, and what we actually need to happen in the plastics agreement is to move that waste from the least developed countries where it's collected to more developed countries where it can be processed. And I fully believe that in a circular economy for plastics, we will see the creation of these sorts of regional hubs to process the, the waste that is collected. Um, and, and, and turn it into new materials. Uh, but we can't do that if we're unable to, to, to move the materials from, from, where, from where they've collected. And we are not going to see um, the creation of chemical recycling facilities in small island developing states. It's just not the economics for that to happen. So the materials need to be collected and they need to be moved to where they can be most effectively processed. Um, so I think, um, I, I think that's really something that we need to continue to educate governments on in the context of the agreement, because right now um, they're, they're actually trying to put barriers in the way of, of trade rather than, rather, rather than the opposite. Yeah. Uh, so Gina, increasingly tariffs and trade investigations are being deployed as mechanisms to protect environmental sustainability. How effective have these been and are there better tools? I think a bit more common sense and reality, uh, <laughs> or a reality check in some of them, would, would be useful. I mean, as, as Greg was saying, uh, I sit in Singapore. Um, we wanted to have plastics waste imported um, because Singapore could process that plastic waste and we could use it as a resource because plastics is a wonderful energy source and it's a valuable resource, but we couldn't move it because you're not allowed to move plastic waste. Um, so that type of thing, as Greg was saying, 
you need to think of consequences. And I know it's difficult for people to think about consequences when they're heavily into the paper and everybody trying to make the right decision cover every dot and T and whatever. Um, but I think some of it is misguided. Maybe that's the way of these things. Uh, I think some of it is actually protectionism by another name. Yep, I agree. <laughs> Fully um, agree. Yeah, we won't go into the details here, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, you can name, name your favorite country. Um, and I, mean, I find it very disappointing to use uh, trade remedies as a weapon because that's not helping anybody. Um, yep. And it's disadvantaging, disadvantaging development. Um, it's not helping the nations that need the help. And some of it is really quite nonsense. Um, but if you start a trade inquiry, then you've already frightened the heck out of several suppliers of that. Um, they're going to move their stuff somewhere else anyway. Um, so it doesn't have to necessarily, I think, even be that real. Uh, you need the numbers in your application to be obvious. Um, but what's behind the numbers isn't always 100% as it is, maybe. So I, 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 see, I think we're seeing too much weaponization of the WTO. Uh, we're not seeing the nations, the developing nations, get the support and the help that they, they need. And as Greg was saying, plastics waste is enormously valuable. So why is it being treated like trash? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, maybe I'm just too old that I remember you would collect these things and get money for them. I mean, what is wrong with that? I mean, what's wrong with collecting plastic waste or waste um, in developing countries and paying money for it? And that, that I think, helps everybody in the economies and uh, in the cycle um, improve. But it's happening in big ideas rather than practice on the ground in many cases. And that's another barrier as well that's inadvertently not doing what it says on the can, as it were. Not on the bottle, because that might be plastic, but on the can. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we're seeing a little bit more of that trend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> Greg, what are some of the ways that the WTO could encourage a more open and inclusive stakeholder process uh, to identify meaningful initiatives on environmental sustainability and plastic pollution? So, and I think, as Gina was saying, I think intervention can be a slippery slope, right? And you've got to make sure that you're, um, that you're, you're not having unintended consequences um, when doing so. Um, what I will say is that demand-side interventions typically tend to work better than supply-side interventions, right? Um, and uh, I, I think uh, we've seen um, the WTO try to do things the wrong way, right? They tried to do an environmental goods agreement where you were going to list the, the products, the supposedly environmentally friendly products that were going to get preferential tariff treatment, treatment. Well, the problem was no one could agree on what that list of products was. And then what about the products, like the products that we make, that go into those environmentally friendly products? Shouldn't they have tariff uh, rebates attached to them as well, right? So it, it's, you can get into these very difficult uh, contexts. Um, another one is carbon border adjustment mechanisms, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we're going to see the EU attempt to, to implement those. Um, but again, to, to Gina's point, is this just disguised protectionism? Um, you know, I think, um, we, you, you know, in the US we have politicians who think that carbon uh, border adjustment mechanisms can be a way to hit China, right? Um, so. You, you know, you get, you get all of these different motives that, that come to play. Um, so in terms of how, you know, what the WTO can do here, I think one, don't duplicate discussions that are going to uh, more appropriately take place in other forums, right? Um, um, two, listen to expert advice. 
uh, and get the right people at the table to help determine uh, the path forward here. And the third is, is really to, to seek to facilitate trade and not to restrict it. Um, there's a dialogue going on in the WTO right now on plastics that unfortunately uh, is giving voice to, to those who would rather restrict play, trade in plastics and facil facilitate it. And I think we need to uh, encourage the WTO re to, re to remember why it was established in the first place, right? Um, and, um, and so I think there's a vital role that stakeholders can, pl can play in making sure that, uh, that governments um, are, are taking the right approaches here. Do you have a perspective on that, Mr. Al Morshed? Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, it's, it's difficult to dispute what Craig is saying. I think if you look at it from different regions, you know, the, uh, the IRA Act in the U.S., as you know, causing a lot of commotion in Europe. The Americans see it as a way to help their industry be green and improve emission and all that. The Europeans see it as a subsidy. Same way others outside Europe seeing the carbon border tax and the restriction on the shipping and all these in Europe being basically trade restriction, you know, uh, trade barriers, non-tariff trade barriers from other countries. And if we go to that game, of everybody setting their own rules, we'll end up with a mess. You know, if Asia, whatever economic blocks of the BRICS countries and the EU and uh, U.S. and Canada and all those make their own de deals. It will be very difficult for any business to be kind of a global. So we're going to go back to regions and states, and, but that will be very, very uneconomical and will drag all the progress that's been made over the years to actually be suboptimal, wh where you want to, to maximize, you want to improve things. But unfortunately, we get in popular governments in different parts of the world that they're really catering to their own election campaign at the expense of almost anything and hurting the progress and hurting trade and, and doing these things. And, you know, we lost the momentum for the last 30, 40 years with globalization. Now we're going back to regionalization. And that's, that's not healthy. That will hurt the environment. That will not promote you know, innovation, science, to solve the problems we are facing today. And if you do it, you know, uh, unfair finance, if you do it, well, I'm going to finance some European countries, industry, but I'm not going to finance Chinese or Middle East or something because, quote, unquote, in my standard, you're not meeting. But what standard? You, you know, you make your own, but others also start to make their own. And we end up in big trouble. You know, the World Trade Organization started, was better than nothing, but now it's been dragged, you know, different politics, different things. We haven't seen anything really coming since the 1990s. And when everybody hoped the uh, World WTO will be really a catalyst and will improve things and do things, we find it being hijacked by politics. And every meeting, you know, happened <laughs> the last 20 or so, 30 years, is being politicized. It's, it's not being economics and trade and, and what we like to see and decarbonization and improving the environment. It's being, you know, how, how much I can get as a country versus what he or she can get. And, but I, again, uh, Martha, I think I'm an optimist. I think at the end of the day, people will have to find, you know, find the logic and nobody is going to isolate themselves like the earth was a thousand years ago. It's, we just don't survive that way. Yeah. We just cannot. Can't go back. We can't make planes from old steel. We can't make cars, mostly wood or something. That's just not going to happen. And for those people who say, well, we don't like plastic, ban it. Well, congratulations. What are you going to do? And somebody doesn't want oil. OK, but if you look at oil consumption, it's actually been going up. And everybody crying wolf when oil goes over 100 and things. But at the same time, the, some banks saying, will not invest in oil exploration and production. Well, then what's, what's the solution? Prices will go through the roof then. And then what to do? And even if you invest in the energy and the chemical, it, it takes five to 10 years cycle. It's not something you do today and tomorrow <laughs> it happens. That doesn't happen. It takes time. And so we have to be logical. But I think I said I'm optimist. I think it will. 
Logic will prevail at the end of the day. There will be pumps along the way. <laughs> we'll get over it. If Gina can get her ships to <laughs> Europe <laughs> and, and doesn't charge us for it that much. <laughs> That's the risk. Thank you. All right. And yeah, that sort of echoes um, part of what uh, 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 Carrie McKee was talking about yesterday with the well-considered um, you know, policies and regulations. We need more of that. Um, Gina, how do we get smaller scale sustainable projects into the areas of greatest need, um, parts of the world like Africa, Latin America, the Pacific region? Preferably, but preferably by being less bureaucratic. Uh, that would be a good start. I was asked recently, uh, you know, if a genie could offer me three wishes, what would they be? And it was going to, to stop all the WTO, all the big think tanks, and start again. Um, and I, thi I think there's so much bureaucracy in the system. There's so many, I, I mean, this is an industry on its own. Um, I mean, it's really an enormous industry. Um, so I think if we want to make it scalable um, and fit for purpose, it shouldn't be, I think we need to listen. I think a whole, a whole pile of issues could be solved by people actually listening to each other and speaking the same language. You and I were talking about that the other day um, and saying that uh, us scientists and economists and engineers speak one language, the environmentalists speak a different language um, the bureaucratic elites speak, I don't know, a different language. Um, so if we could all understand each other, that would be a very good starting point. And then we can, we can actually become good listeners. And if we listen to the people that are actually living in Africa, that are living in Indonesia, um, that are living in Miramar, wherever, uh, Latin America, um, then we can find solutions for them that actually are fit for purpose because our industry is, as we've all been saying, very innovative, uh, very creative, uh, pretty wealthy as well, and we have a great deal of expertise. But if we go to those third world countries or fourth or fifth world countries and say to them, well, this is how we do it in, I don't know, the Netherlands or Germany or Saudi or New York, um, then it's probably really not going to work for them. And so I think it's just taking all the fluff and all the noise and all the paper uh, out of it and actually listening to people on the ground. I mean, there's no point in coming up with fantastic systems for plastics waste if you don't have a collection system for the plastics waste. You know, go to Indonesians or Bali, see what happens to all the plastics. And we have monsoons in Asia, and it ends up in the sea. Um, so we have to start at the local level. And I think if we listen to people, it doesn't have to be big, expensive projects. Uh, they can be small, they can be sustainable, and they can be scalable. And that's actually good for those countries and good for the people in those countries because they're in control of their own destiny. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the rest of us have been a catalyst, but we haven't come in and said, this is how you do it if you work for Tasney or if you work for Sabic or if you work for whoever. Yeah. Um, listen. And I suspect if we listened a little bit more and preached a little bit less, then perhaps that would be a good starting point. And as I said, just get rid of an awful lot of the bureaucracy. Yeah, Martha, something comment. And, uh, you know, it's like the IFRS. I was just in a meeting the other day in Dubai about the IFRS. They're trying to come up with sustainability KPIs, sustainability measure, as they do in the financial statements. And they, over the years, they collected something like 250 things they want to measure. And then people said, that's just not, not possible. 250 is just too much. We're going to be filling forms forever. <laughs> Finally, they came up with like 100 or slightly less than 100. After all the work, and they came to the industry, as you say, and you have to go to the people. They came to the people who have been impacted. They said, this 100 is great. 
but we have no way to get this data. So you make something, set a standard, that's just impossible, even to get the data to me. So you need to get to the people who are actually affected. Let it be somewhere in a poorer or less developed country and see how it can be handled. You cannot come to them and say, this is what we do in this part of the world of Europe or in America or somewhere. It's good for us, so it must be good for you. No, that does not gonna work. That's gonna be really an issue. And you cannot also tell them, as we said earlier, you're gonna stay poor for a while longer than you think because we're gonna have to improve the environment. And measure a hundred. And measure a thousand <laughs> times. You know, you know I, I, I was going to, you know, many years for the uh, Davos and all these things, and all this noise about the fossil fuel. Ukraine war, suddenly Europe not having gases. Suddenly the people who, you know, crying wolf and fossil fuel, fire and coal. So what kind of logic is that? Telling people don't, you know, burn gas, but now you burn coal yourself? That's, that's totally illogical, and outsiders see it as a double standard. It's pure double standard. You cannot do this. And the other side of the world saying, hell with it. Whatever you say, I'm not going to listen to you. Because you're doing opposite what we said when you needed it. We said, Khalas, forget all this. We're going to fire coal. <laughs> but I think one of the things to make, the, if you have small things, you can afford to fail mm -hmm. and move on. Mm -hmm. If you start with big, enormous monster projects, it's more difficult to accept that failure, and it's much more expensive. Definitely. Um, so I don't see that there's anything wrong with starting small, failing, learning, moving on, and improving as you go. And that's why I, I really believe um, that we've got to tone down the big things and actually just start doing more, but doing more in, in small ways. Right. I mean, that history shows us that's how a lot of technological advancement has occurred in these small <laughs> incremental ways. Yeah. Um, Greg, moving back to the WTO, um, there have been many recommendations, even by the WTO itself, for how uh, the WTO and its members can keep pace with what seems to be constantly changing political, technological, and environmental changes. You know, we're just talking about um, what are some of the recommendations to support a broader modernization strategy for uh, global trade and its organizations? So, Martha, I'm an optimist by <laughs> nature as well. Um, but what I will say is that uh, trade has always been subject to political will, right? Uh, if you have countries that are prepared to lead, then um, we make progress. Um, if you don't, um, then it's more difficult to make progress. So can the WTO be modernized? I think the jury's out on that. Um, uh, a lot of the traditional leaders on trade just aren't there right now. In fact, 2020 US election, for the first time that I can recall, we had both major candidates expressing basically anti-trade positions. Um, you know, Donald Trump saying if he's re-elected, he's gonna put a 10% tariff on everything. Uh, I don't believe for a minute that would ever be implemented, but, uh, but these are some of the, the, some of the rhetoric that's out there. And unfortunately, trade is also an easy issue to demagogue. It's easy if you have an, econ an industry that is uh, not performing well to look at trade and say trade is the reason for that rather than the poor performance of the industry. Um, and, and, and I think that's, we've seen a fair bit of that happen um, over the last 20 years, and it's unfortunate. I agree with Mr. Amarashid that I think the deglobalization theme is overemphasized, right? Um, the, the logic that promoted globalization in the first place is still there. But unfortunately, we have seen um, politics uh, driven, in some cases, by, by populism uh, and, and the need to have easy answers to difficult questions. Um, it, it's made it, made it a little more difficult. So, you know, I think what the WTO should do is really focus on discrete trade facilitative interventions, right? As Gina was saying, start small. Uh, I think the prospects of us doing another major trade round uh, are very limited right now. So start small, uh, listen to the experts, um, and, and, and make some make some step by step incremental progress, uh, and that might help to build trust back in the system again. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to require political leadership uh, to get us where we need to get. Terrific. Um, 
So I think we are starting to run out of time, but I think in the last few minutes that we have, I'd like to go around and ask if any of you have any final remarks that you would like to make, any takeaways you'd like to convey to our audience, um, starting with you. Yeah, I think the best thing is, is to be fair, to give people in developing economies, uh, or maybe less even developing economies, we are not all equal, your fingers are not equal, and give people a chance to progress and accept there will be some less progress in certain part of Earth than certain part of Earth. So we can't have one size fits all. So we have to be sensitive to the needs of humans everywhere, not just in my region, without thinking about others in different continents and under different circumstances. So we need to be sensitive and to be logical about making it possible for other people to progress and have a better living, and therefore people will listen to us and they will improve. Because nobody, poor or rich, will ever say, I want to pollute the earth, I want to pollute the atmosphere. No one does. And, but people need to progress, and the, you know, the progress has a cost to it. And the lucky one who did their progress when there is no restriction, no rules, you can do what you want. It's fine, but once they reach that stage, they cannot dictate to the guys below uh, what, what to do. So I think uh, some common sense, a sense of fairness, given countries, different region, uh, some transition period, like it happened in every change, is the way to go. And not force it or cut finance or cut, uh, you know, subsidies from certain countries to other poorer countries. That will not help us all. That, that's my view. Gina? Well, I'm Scottish, and being surrounded by optimists, I'm not so sure about this. Um, uh, I'm optimistic, but I think that's <laughs> Scottish, uh, but maybe. Um, but, but I agree. I think we need to, to breathe um, and look again at what we're trying to achieve. Um, I think, you know, there's no doubt about it that climate change is real. I mean, I'm, I'm totally convinced uh, climate change is real and we all have responsibilities, but all means all of us. It doesn't just mean some of us and then others yell and shout and aren't very good at the listening. So I think everybody has to listen. Uh, I'm sure many of the people that know me would say that's not always necessarily my chief skill set. Um, I know it's difficult, but I think we have to do it. Uh, we have to start listening, and we've got to simplify things and stop making them more difficult instead of making the, make them easier, make them fit for purpose, make them achievable. There's nothing wrong with small. Small's fine. Mm -hmm. A lot can be done with small. Yeah. yeah. Greg? So this is, you know, our industry is one of the most trade-dependent industries out there, right? In fact, about 40% of world trade in chemicals is intra-company, right? Companies moving materials from one production facility to another. Um, so we have a real stake here in, in making sure that, um, that, that, you know, the barriers to, to, uh, to trade are, are addressed. And I think um, we have a role to play in engaging with our governments um, to encourage them to, to set the rules that enable our industry to flourish. And that's particularly the case when it comes to sustainability and circularity. Um, we, need the, we need governments to create the enabling environments uh, and we need to advocate for those environments ourselves. Um, so we have a job to do as well in terms of educating uh, the decision makers about what is important to our industry and what can help us um, speed the transition because I totally agree with what others have said today that you know this is a really exciting time to be in our industry. Um, we have the solutions um, and, and we now need to be able to deploy them at scale uh, in the right places. So I think, um, so I think you know, it's, it, we have a job to do here in terms of telling our story better, engaging with governments, engaging with the communities um, to explain uh, the critical role that we can play going forward. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. This has been a really um, great, robust discussion. Um, please join me in thanking our speakers. And...